honored to be uh, part of the very famous uh, program here, the, the, the uh, Summer Notice Scholar Program. And uh, also very honored to, to give the course to students and uh, uh, for this lecture today. And uh, uh, when I gave the course, the course name uh, called uh, East Wisdom Traditions, Zhang Dui, Curriculum Theory, and the Teacher Education. When I gave the course, I uh, focused on theoretical level, on uh, wisdom, curriculum, and the teacher education. But today, uh, I try to focus on you know, the practical level, level and uh, change the, uh, the perspective from curriculum theory to pedagogy. And also, uh, you know, cor correlate my ideas on the name of the department, curriculum and pedagogy. So, uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the couple of things uh, uh, to you. The first is the history of the relationship of teaching and research. The second one is what is research-based pedagogy. The third one is as a teacher, how to teach. The fourth one is examples. And the fifth, the last one is my experimental framework uh, uh, I'm, I have been doing in China. I will extend the first three parts and the last two, uh, two parts I will just, you know, give some uh, simple uh, introduction. And uh, I will finish my talks, you know, in one hour and then let's have dialogues. And uh, we have so many uh, great scholars uh, here today so we can have a very, you know, deep discussion with all of you. Uh, but before I extend my understanding on research-based pedagogy, I try to raise uh, or, or present my uh, uh, ideas on teaching. You know, I, I want to generalize my, my ideas on teaching in the following points. Because uh, when I was 18 years old, I was a rural place school teacher. So I, I stand in the classroom and taught for uh, uh, close to 30 years. So I have to uh, talk about my own ideas on teaching or, or learning or pedagogy. And my points can generalize the, the, uh, as the follows. The first one is the integrity of curriculum and teaching. And uh, in China, we have three so-called schools. The first is big teaching and uh, small uh, curriculum. Yongming, you know, Professor, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Yongming from Beijing Normal University, he can, uh, uh, you know, find the, the schools. Uh, big, uh, big uh, teaching and uh, uh, small curriculum. Curriculum, just a little uh, part of teaching. This is the first school. Second school is Big curriculum, small teaching. You know, teaching is part of curriculum. And the third one is the integrity of curriculum and the teaching. That means the meaning of a curriculum is a teaching event. And the meaning of teaching is a, a, a process of curriculum development. You know, any teaching means create, creating curriculum. You know, any curriculum must be not kept in a very limited place, must be think about their meaning in classrooms and other uh, fields. You know, this is called the integrity of teaching and the curriculum. I'm the person to raise this idea. So uh, everybody know I'm the first one to, to, to raise the integrity of curriculum and teaching. And uh, I think you know the, the split of teaching and the curriculum may be general, generalize uh, the problems for the curriculum developers you use their power to control school teachers and the students. So this is the first point. The second point, point is the integrity, uh, integrity of teaching and the dialogue or conversation. We can use other words, dialogical teaching or conversational teaching. You know, for this idea, you know, try to correct the, the traditional thinking that 
thinking about the teaching and the learning use the entity based thinking. Entity based thinking means three entity. First is teaching and learning. Uh, first is uh, teachers. Second is students. The third one is subject matters. Put these three things together and form a mechanic association. Combi combination means teaching or learning. You know, I think it is you know as uh, the entity based thinking. So I try to correct this thinking and uh, make teaching and learning as a relational uh, category. The relational means dependent on each other. You know, this is the second point. The third point is the integrity of teaching and life, or life-based teaching. There are two main points. The first point is any teaching must be related to the social life, everyday life. It is part of life. This is the first meaning. The second meaning is teaching itself is a life. For teachers, teaching itself is a life. You know, that means teaching is your life. You should uh, find your, your, your meaning of life in your teaching process. You should use your spirit and, and uh, body to embody the meaning of teaching or subject matters. You know, textbooks, papers, reading stuff, you know, these kind of things, you know, are, are musical notes. And the teaching is sounds. So this is the, the, the third point. The fourth, fourth point is the integrity of teaching and the research or inquiry. Here, I you know, uh, intentionally use research, not inquiry. For me, these two things are, are similar. I, I try to use research, the, the word research, try to, to find the simil, sim, similarity or commonality between a young kid and a professional scientists. Both of them are research. If we use the research for kids, we can, you know, uh, give a, you know, it, uh, for kids, they also do research. You know, for, we can use this to, to, to describe the, uh, the behavior of kids. But they have com com uh, commonalities. Professional scientists and young kids, they have commonalities to think about their own world, to read their own ideas, and to justify their own ideas. You know, this is a, the fourth point. I uh, composed all the ideas in one book published in, in 2010. It is called Research-Based Pedagogy, a, a thick uh, book. So this is you know, my main points. Today, I try to focus on the last one, you know, the research-based pedagogy or teaching. The first thing I want to mention, the history of the relationship between teaching and research. I want to uh, generalize the whole history into three uh, stages. <laughs> the first stage is uh, I call ancient era. You know, ancient era means from the very early uh, age to modern society, uh, before the Renaissance and uh, the Enlightenment. I call this, this period the ancient era. And for China, the ancient era you know, lasted in late 19th century because we have no uh, the event like uh, Renaissance or Enlightenment, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, this is the meaning of it. And these two persons, according to a very famous philosopher, uh, Jaspers said they are the creators of axial, axial period. Axial periods. So both of them are very ugly but very important, <laughs> you know. And they uh, created the, the 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 tradition for for education for teaching. For example, Confucius is the most famous educator in Chinese history, and uh, Socrates. Socrates is uh, maybe one of the most important figures uh, in Western education, especially teaching. You know, maybe he is the first person to raise the ideas of dialogical teaching. You know, this is the first stage. The second stage I try to focus on from the, uh, the Western world, from the Renaissance, Enlightenment to late 19th century or early 20th century. And the third stage is, you know, in 
20th century. You know, this is my how I uh, uh, divide the different eras in the history. And just to talk about some points, the first point is, you know, in the ancient era, if we think about the relationship between teaching and the research, we can find that the creation of knowledge and the teaching process are integrated, united, or one process. Or we can extend the ideas, you know, in the curriculum development. For example, in Chinese background, we have so-called six classics, and all the six classics were developed or created by Confucius. The meaning is to teach his disciples, students. You know? So the teaching, creating knowledge, and the curriculum development, the three things are a trinity, are one thing. You know, we, we can't find some people to create, produce, invent knowledge, others to distribute knowledge. No. They, they, they put it together. You know, it's the first, it is the first uh, character. The second character is teachers put knowledge of not knowing at the core of teaching. Both Confucius and the Socrates, they uh, very honestly acknowledge that they know nothing about knowledge. They try to have a dialogue with their students. You know, we are very famous, uh, we, we are very familiar with Socrates' ideas. What I do not know, I don't think I know. Or use other words, I know only one thing, that I know nothing. You know, it, it, it is his famous idea. That's why he uh, invented the, the arts of midwife. You know, the dialogical uh, uh, idea or the seminars. You know, this one. And the Confucius also has this kind of ideas. For example, in the Analects, Confucius said, uh, do I have knowledge? No, I don't. A simple peasant, peasant, uh, a simple peasant uh, came to ask me a question. He is also ignorant. I'm ready to thread the matter out with all its pros and coins to the very end. You know, also the, uh, uh, acknowledge his ignorance uh, on knowledge. You know, that's very important. But there are differences between Confucius and Socrates. You know, what uh, Confucius said is uh, you know, try to do moral inquiry. Moral inquiry. But for Socrates, he did, you know, logical inquiry. Just uh, ask a question, 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 and question. You know, conclusions are, are you know, uh, conclusions uh, have, have uh, no uh, much importance. But the, the, the process of inference uh, is very important for Socrates, but for Confucius, no. You know, because his aim to, uh, is to help students to, to develop their, their morality or their moral feelings. So be, because all the morality is based on the feelings or emotions, meanwhile, they have to have the uh, reason to justify their feelings. So the, the feelings, emotion, and the reasons put them together and do good things. That means moral or morality. So they have to you know, keep the logical inference and use the feelings to, to stimulate uh, other feelings that we can have with the morality. It's Confucius. Very different if you, 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 you read the word of them, you know, you can find it. And the second stage is the era of Renaissance and the Enlightenment through uh, uh, late 19th century. Many scholars, philosophers think this era, uh, you know, this period, are the period uh, for the human society, for, uh, you know, developed very fast, or fastest uh, era in the whole human history. And a lot of events happened during this area. For example, the Renaissance, the Religional Reformation, the emergence of Protestants, and the Methodization Movement. And Professor Bill Dore, um, you know, analyzed 
uh, told the, 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 the story of methodization movement uh, you know, very in details and gave a very, very uh, strong, powerful uh, comment on it uh, in his paper, The Couch of Method. You know, it's very strong uh, paper. Uh, you, if you want to uh, uh, know the story in this period, you can, you can read it. You know, what's the meaning of methodization movement? Why a teacher always tell students the truth because of the methodization movement, uh, movement in the 18th, uh, 16th century? You know, it's the first event. The second one is the Enlightenment in 18th century. And, uh, you know, after that, the birth of modern science and the technology. You know, Galileo put mathematics and uh, experimentation together and uh, the modern science and technology uh, was generated. Okay, and uh, the, the industrialization movement thereafter. You know, this, this is the social events. And uh, back, uh, you know, on the uh, background of these events, the field of teaching, it, you know, uh, was thoroughly changed. And uh, now these persons we can mention. The first one is Ramus and uh, Ramism. Ramus, Peter Ramus and the Ramism. Uh, Professor uh, Biodor, uh, you know, did a very detailed uh, historical research in his paper. P uh, Ramus and the Ramism deeply influenced uh, Comenius. And uh, that's the reason why Comenius published the book, The Great Didactics. And uh, it is you know, one tradition of the didactics in, uh, in Europe. You know, if we go back to uh, Comenius ideas, we can find that uh, Comenius may be the first person to create the classroom-based teaching system. Classroom-based teaching system. And he gave a, uh, a metaphor uh, in his book, The Great Didactics. You know, since, since one brick maker can produce thousands of bricks one time, and one bread maker can produce hundreds of pieces of bread, why don't the teachers teach students, teach hundreds of uh, uh, students one time. You know, it is in his uh, idea, his metaphor. That means, you know, knowledge is the material to produce students. So it is, uh, it is uh, uh, use the industry as a model of classroom teaching. And uh, the values are control students. And the, the, the epistemology, the teaching theory is the knowledge is somebody created as the objective truth. Knowledge is the objective truth. So the job of a teacher is to distribute them. You know, just as coming you said, teachers, you know, the only job for teachers to, uh, you know, to, to do is to distribute knowledge. You just know how to transmit, how to distribute. You, don't, you need not know the, the essence of knowledge. You need not understand what you teach. Just knew the method to, to distribute. You know, this is communist idea, the great uh, dynamics, di di didactics, didactics. And uh, after the human society went to, you know, uh, the enlightenment, Herbert, Herbert raised his famous idea so-called formal stages of teaching. You know, one period can be divided into four steps, four stages, and they are very uh, linear. First step, second step, uh, and so on. And uh, the thinking style, thinking we on the uh, formal stages of teaching is uh, analytical thinking. Analytical thinking. You know, the whole knowledge even the whole world can be divided into different parts. And if we put a different parts together, it, is, it will form a whole. That is why, you know, the first step, analytical. Second step, things, uh, you know, put it together. Uh, the third step is practice it. 
and the last step is uh, 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 last step is you know uh, applied. You know, it is a uh, analytical thinking based on the Enlightenment reason. So his students said, "Your four steps are too rough. You know, I will add another one: preparation." This is a so, so-called four steps of uh, classroom teaching. You know, and this thing, you know, go through the forms of the uni and then go to China, form the circumstances of classroom teaching after 1949 in, in China. You know, this thing. So, uh, from this uh, area, we can generalize uh, some ideas. That is the separation of pedagogy and research. You know, their, their ideas are some persons create knowledge, others distribute and transmit knowledge. So it is the, uh, the lab or job division. And the knowledge, the, the, the meaning of knowledge is to control. And the, the essence of knowledge is objective truth. And the factory or industry is a model for teaching or education. Even for the early uh, 20th century in U.S. Curriculum field, we can find this idea: education as production, school as a factory, and so on. This is this is the, the movement of social engineering in educational field. We can find the idea from William Charters, you know, from William Charters, Franklin Barbit, and other educators. They hold this idea: education as production, and uh, school as a factory, and uh, how to do a uh, how to do accountability for school teachers. You know, for, for, for one period, you have to finish the 200 objectives. If you just finished 100, so 50% P. You know, it is very familiar in, in the early 20th century in U.S. And the third stage is the era of educational democratization movement. I think you know, this area is very important. Uh, in representatives of uh, the progressive education in North America and the new education movement in Europe. That's very important because after this period, in after this period, you know, the educators, educators think that education is very important for the society because education is a rational is a rational event or rational course. Education is a rational course. If we use the education to improve society, it will be very helpful. If we think about John Dewey's idea, you know, his main idea is use, the, use uh, education as a main force for the uh, involvement of human society. You know, this, this is John Dewey's main ideas. John Dewey said, in the natural world, the, the, the force, you know, the, the natural force uh, are the, f uh, the, the motivation for the evolvement of natural world. In human society, inquiry is the main force for the evolvement uh, of human society. So how to do it? You know, because adults are very familiar with the social uh, customs, so we should start with the young kids. They haven't uh, you know, being destroyed by the adult society. So that's the idea. So the democratic classroom is the main idea for classroom teaching. And if we think deep of this period, we can find that John Dewey, you know, John Dewey's idea, learning, teaching and learning, just like buy and selling. You know, this is his idea. And this idea, you know, try to focus on the relationship by uh, buying and selling related with each other, dependent on each other. Teaching and learning dependent on each other. You know, it's a relational thinking because democracy is relational, is uh, interactional. The second one is teaching and learning is, uh, you know, uh, equal to, you know, uh, equal to, to inquiry or problem solving or intellectual uh, thinking and so on. 
you know, this is Zhang Duwei's second meaning. And if the Zhang Duwei's most famous Chinese educator Tao Xingzhi, you know, he gave up his, uh, his uh, doctoral degree and go back to China and do another, uh, another part of educational uh, democratization in China called New Education, New education uh, <laughs> Reform Movement in China. So, uh, when Tao Xingzhi young, Tao Xingzhi, Tao Xingzhi at his uh, 20th years old, when he went back to China, there is a university in Nanjing called Southeast University. The president asked Tao Xingzhi, you are an educator, so please come here uh, to be an uh, administrator uh, and uh, uh, in charge of the university teaching. You know, Tao Xingzhi said, that's okay, but you have to change one word. Which word? Teaching. You know, I don't know if you can hear. Huh? In, in Chinese background, teaching is like this. This is a verb, means teaching or teach. You know, in Chinese background, my, some, many people call me Professor Zhang, but in Chinese, Zhang Jiao Shou. You know, Zhang Jiao Shou, you know, Professor Zhang, Zhang Jiao Shou, means you are the person to transmit the knowledge. You know, teaching is very one direction from teacher to students in Chinese background. Tao Xing Zhi said, change it, please change it in this. You know, this is Jiao Xue, this is teach, this is learn, teaching and learning. The president said, okay, let's debate. <laughs> Organized 20 professors have a discussion, a seminar with, with uh, Tao Xingzhi, and they called for two hours, but nobody wants to change the name. So I'm still called Zhang Jiao Shou. <laughs> Nobody tried to change the name. Yes, yeah, so, so Tao Xingzhi said, if you don't change it, I will give you the job up. So he go back to, to uh, write one paper called The Unity of Teaching and Learning. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, use the new idea to, to change the background. And, uh, you know, uh, about one, one year later, he uh, published another paper called The Unity of Teaching, Learning, and Doing. You know, just to, you know, fully embody John Dewey's idea. So, the, this one is embody the relationship, and this one embody the, 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 you know, intrinsic relation between teaching, learning, and research. Doing means research. You know, hands on, doing, learning by doing, research, projects, and so on. So, uh, let's go to the, uh, the late part of the 20th century. You know, everybody knows the movement of the structures of disciplines from late 1950s to late 1960s. This event happened in the U.S. because, uh, because of the Cold War. You know, but it influenced the, the, all the world. You know, in 1970s, all the Japanese curriculum, Korean curriculum, embodied the, the model, you know, borrowed the model of the uh, movement of uh, uh, structures of disciplines. You know, in the 1970s, you can find it in Europe. And in China, we can find it in 1980s. So this, this movement is an important uh, academic event even, you know, because it influences the whole world. I think, you know, uh, the motivation for this reform is bad. It's very bad, very instrumental, and so on. And uh, uh, Jerome S. Brunner, the, 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 the main figure, his ideas at that time is very, very scientific, very, very instrumental. <coughs> You know, no, no doubt about that. But this area 
for U.S. technical field, they, you know, silently to borrow the ideas of inquiry into subject matters and think it deeper. For example, John uh, Bruner's books on uh, educational uh, process and uh, Joseph Schwab's idea on teaching science as inquiry published uh, in, in, in 1960s uh, at Harvard University Press. You can find it. You know, to my knowledge, they borrow the idea of inquiry and uh, deepen it into separate matters or disciplines. So, uh, uh, you know, separate matters, the idea of separate matters are also inquiry. This, this is the main achievement for this period. You know, uh, Jeremy S. Bruner uh, wrote a paper called After John Dewey, what? This, this paper published in Saturday Review, uh, Saturday Review uh, in about 1959. And he discussed his uh, difference uh, with John Dewey, but I also find the similarities between Jerome S. Bruner and John Dewey. And he also made a mistake that he limited the inquiry into the, the structure of disciplines, but in 1970s, Jeremy S. Bruna changed his way. You know, he raised the idea, parallel curriculum, uh, Saturday, Wednesday, uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, to do, to, to, to inquire uh, subject matter structure, and uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, Thursday, and Saturday, go, to, go on the streets and study poverty, homeless, and so on. You know, this is so called parallel uh, curriculum uh, of uh, Bruna. You know, this is uh, uh, the idea. So we can find the 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 the, the here. You know, this is a school classroom in 1906 in U.S. You know, everybody everybody sit very little to the teacher, right? You know, but and this is the American classroom in 1950s. German uh, as Bruna's period. You know sit together and uh, have a discussion in a group uh, work and so on. And this is the classroom today. So the, the, the fence between the classroom and the world, you know, was moved out. So uh, I generalize the, 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 the historical thinking. The relationship between pedagogy and research is one of the basic questions to understand the essence of classroom practice. And uh, uh, between pedagogy and, and the teaching and the learning, uh, uh, you know, uh, pedagogy and the teaching, learning, and the research, you know, there are three stages. Unity, separation, and the new unity. It is a, a very rough map of the relationship of them. So, this is the first thing. The second thing I want to mention, what do I mean by research-based pedagogy? I just want to read two points and uh, explain it uh, a little bit. The first point is the essence of school subjects is the knowledge of students and the teachers during their interactions with subject matters and their life worlds. You know, if we go back to the history of curriculum, we can find uh, the, uh, the invention of this idea. I just try to mention a, a, a couple of scholars, you know, four to five scholars. The first one is John Dewey's idea. Uh, I call this idea or democratic view of knowledge. And what's the meaning of democratic view of knowledge? That means the production, the, uh, the invention, uh, and the teaching of knowledge that, uh, is a democratic, democratic process. No. And the John Dewey's main contributions are two. The first is the psychologization, the psychologization of such matters. You can very familiar with, uh, you can find the, the meaning of it in his very, very thin book, The Child and the Curriculum. This is the, the cover of The Child and the Curriculum when it published. And uh, in this small book, John Dewey said, 
the everyday experience of a kid is very different from the subject matters. You know, you should find the intrinsic value of the everyday experience and the personal knowledge of each kid or the generations of kids. You know, if you uh, uh, confuse the, the lines, uh, the division between them, you will do training things for students and the students will be, uh, you know, uh, miseducated. Uh, that's his, his, his main idea. But he also find the, uh, the relationship between the child's experience and the, the experiences from the disciplines. You know, both of them are experience. That means the, uh, the very active interaction between the subjects and their world. You know? Because they have the relationship, so all the subject matters, all the conclusions, principles, concepts, and so-called hard science, hard knowledge, can be transformed into children's experience. That's his main idea. And the, uh, the biggest secrets for teaching, for curriculum development, is transmission. If you learn to transmission, learn to transmit, uh, trans uh, transform, you will learn to teach. It's done to this idea, the, the, uh, the, the first idea. The second contribution is the socialization of subject matters. Many books, for example, the school and the society and other books focus on this. All the subject matters are, have the intrinsic uh, relationship uh, with the human world. You know, the scientists are not higher than the everyday workers. The scientists should learn to know the relationship with, with the, the everyday life and the work of the uh, social workers. You know, you can find your true meaning uh, of science research. And the everyday workers, if they learn to do reflective thinking, you can know the meaning of their job. This is John Dewey's ideas. So that, that, that is the socialization of some matters. So students' experience and knowledge are part of school curriculum. The contemporary uh, social life is part of school curriculum. It is uh, uh, the first person. The second person, uh, two persons are Schwab and Lee Schurman. You know, everybody know in this department, I think, everybody know Lee Schurman because of a smart concept, pedagogical learning, only one thing pedagogical content knowledge, PCK, they, they know uh, Lee Schurman. And uh, uh, many persons forget the relationship between Lee Schurman and uh, Joseph Schwab. You know, the pedagogical content knowledge is just the, the continuum refinement of Joseph Schwab's 1978 papers, Practical Three Translations into Curriculum. You know, here is the four com common, uh, common places, teachers, students, uh, subject matters, and media. Four, four common places form uh, a curriculum, uh, curriculum elite, curriculum uh, whole. You know, teachers as curriculums. Teachers as curriculum is to show the idea. And based on this idea, Lee Schurman, with the concept pedagogical content knowledge. That's important. That's important. For me, two points. The first is, the first is we should not totally agree, uh, totally agree with Lee Schurman's interpretation of PCK. No, 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 no need to, to, to do this. We should give rise to our own understandings of PCK. This is the first point. The second point, the true meaning of PCK is acknowledges or reveal the meaning of teacher knowledge. Teacher has the, their own knowledge. That's the theoretical or epistem epistemological foundation for their, for their autonomy. You know, if autonomy, teacher's autonomy, professional autonomy is a is a value or axiological uh, meanings. 
but they ha must have the, the theoretical or, 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 or knowledge foundation, epistemological foundation, that is, teachers have their own specific knowledge. Because the teacher have their, have their own specific knowledge, so they and the scientists are different jobs. We should adopt different standards to judge them, to evaluate them. That's a very important idea, you know? This is a, so teacher experience and knowledge are the dynamic and the integral constitution of school curriculum. That's the important meaning uh, for, for Lee Schurman and Schwab. And uh, I want to mention Pine and Bill Doss ideas on teaching. You know, in 1995, uh, Bill Pine raised the idea, curriculum as complicated conversations. And uh, thereafter, he raised the idea of teaching in the third space, in the synoptic text uh, book. You know, I think these ideas have, uh, you know, continued the, the, the understanding of, uh, of teacher's knowledge and the student knowledge is the core of the curriculum. School subjects. You know, uh, Professor William Dawes, uh, for arts-based curriculum and teaching and the complexity-based curriculum and teaching also have the same meaning. You know, I, if I put all the uh, contributions together, we can find the essence of school subjects. Uh, firstly, school subjects have intrinsic values. School subjects are different from the, uh, the uh, disciplines academic disciplines. They are the uh, integration of subject matters, teachers' experience, students' experience, and uh, social situations. Second, so the subject of school subjects is both teachers and the students. Just as uh, Professor Bill Piner said, you know, subject is a double, how to pronounce the word, uh, intended, huh? Uh, entendre, I know. You know, yeah. You know, uh, subject is a double entendre. Entendre. You know, it both the uh, human being and the subject matters. So the subject, uh, school subjects, is both teachers and students. And the aim of school subjects is to exert the educational values of uh, disciplines. So the learning stories created, told by school teachers and their students, you know, are the core of school subjects. So that's important. And the, uh, Professor Bill Do also uh, revealed the meaning of a story for curriculum. You know, our stories should be told, uh, revealed, uh, explored, and theorizing theorized in the classroom, and it is a core of school subjects. You know, this is the first point. The second point is the nature of school subjects is inquiry. I uh, once used the metaphor fish. If we uh, think knowledge is a fish, and this fish can only be caught by a net made by inquiry. If we use another net, for example, the net of training, distributing knowledge, distributing uh, knowledge, and do more and more exercises, you know, you will catch more fishes, but the fishes are dead. <laughs> you know, that means the knowledge have no life. Bill Doe also use the word, keep knowledge alive. How to keep it? You know, inquiry. This is a uh, so. The inquiry is not only the process to create knowledge originally, but also the one to teach and learn knowledge. You know, so I raise an idea. You know, all discoveries are inventions, including the knowledge uh, discoveries in classroom. So the nature differences between uh, disciplines and the school subjects are not the former are uh, inquiry based, the latter now inquiry based but the difference in uh, inquiry subjects and the meanings. This is uh, uh, the second point, uh, you know, uh, oh, uh, you know uh, the essence of subjects. 
And for the meaning of pedagogy, research-based pedagogy, I will mention the, the second and the last idea. That is, teaching is teacher's children's study, which is the basic character of democratic teaching. Teaching is teacher's children's study. I try to raise the idea, you know, or, or emphasize the idea that classroom teaching and the teacher's children's research are one thing. You know, put it together. If you want to teach, please understand your kids, your students. After you got the understanding of your kids, whatever you do, maybe, uh, you know, very educative. So, teachers research or teach the understanding of their students are the core of teaching. And the teachers as children researchers, I, read this, uh, I gave the, this definition uh, many years ago, I still keep it, you know. So, I use uh, a few minutes to, 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 to go over the history. This person, Zhang G. He is important because he finds the uniqueness of children's knowing, children's understanding. That's important. If we go back to the era of the Enlightenment, we find that Jean Rousseau is the first person maybe in history to, to read the intrinsic values of children. But Jean Rousseau know nothing about the uniqueness of children's knowledge. And this person, maybe firstly to systematically study how different between children's knowing and adults knowing. You can, you can disagree with his conclusions. You know, you can read your own ideas. You can, especially, you can, you can disagree with his uh, a little bit mechanical stages of force four stages of human life. You can disagree with it. But, you know, his understanding of the uniqueness of children is important. So, his in the clinical interviewing method is also important because this research process is not based on the, the split, the uh, destroying of children knowing. Just natural observing. That's important. This is four person. The second person is his student, uh, Barbara Inhard. You know, he always, she always lived in the shadow of Ram G. So many person overlooked his, uh, her contributions. He, she is very important because he, you know, uh, developed Ram G's idea on clinical interviewing, in the critical exploration. Critical interpretation means many, uh, a, a, a group of kids get together, one or two teachers involve them, and when they help students, uh, the, the teacher, during teachers helping students product-based learning, and they know research students' understanding. You know, it, is very, uh, uh, it is very close to classroom teaching. So, our common friend, Anna Duckworth, Ram PhD student, just, you know, simply use Ram Dewey and, uh, and uh, in her idea, use in teaching. So, uh, the first time I met uh, uh, Doug was uh, in, in 2002, when I was a Fulbright, uh, Fulbright scholar at Harvard University. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was at his class, the first was, I'm Ram PhD and uh, Babo in her the students. I just do one thing, put the ideas in classroom. You know, this, if you want to know, know it, it's very, you can, so it, uh, he, uh, her book, The Having of Wonderful Ideas, I translated in Chinese uh, many years ago. And uh, tell me more, listening to students explain. I also introduced to, uh, to China. <laughs> I think that's important when the uh, adults learn to listen to their children or the younger generation, you know, the society will be getting much better. Mm. So, so, in sum, broadly speaking, teaching is based 
on the understanding of students' understanding. So it must be seamlessly integrated with teachers' research on their students. Specifically speaking, teaching field experienced the evolving development of teaching as child children study, just as from PRG to Inherit and to Ed Douglas. And we, maybe we can find other other uh, lines in the history, you know. The the third point is when teaching becomes children study, it is also a process to promote the teacher's professional development. So teacher research, teacher's action research, how to do this kind of thing. How to do, you know, the basic way is to change their teaching in, uh, in the research. That is the true meaning or, or important meaning of teacher research or teacher's action research. And uh, this also embodies the difference between teacher's children research and the professional psychologist's uh, children research. The last point is how to teach. You know, I think no fixed model of teaching, no single teaching method or way. How to teach? Deeply getting involved in the situations, fully based on the need of students and the styles of teachers to make teaching as authentic research cooperated by students and the teachers. You know, make teaching as authentic research is the true meaning of teaching. That's my, you know, main idea. And I can find the basic elements of research-based pedagogy. For example, problematic and meaningful situations, uh, collaborative inquiry, uh, listening and uh, conversations, and uh, communications and exhibitions are the elements in a, in a classroom teaching or classroom practice. And the basic process are teachers create situations which imply students' ideas. Teachers are willing to accept and understand and research students' understandings and ideas. Teachers are good at using dialogues and conversations to deepen the inquiry process. You know, every classroom period is a whole. Uh, and uh, uh, all the periods put together are, the, are also a whole. You know, we should have this kind of idea. So, uh, teachers constantly listen to students explain. The, the process for students to explain their ideas is the true meaning of learning, also the meaning of teaching. So we should learn to listen to uh, students' ideas, talking, and you know, uh, uh, heard their voice, uh, hear their voice, and try to understand the meaning of it. You know, the fifth uh, point is teachers persist in doing action research and the descriptive research during their teaching. I agree with uh, Eleanor Duckworth. No, no doubt, no evaluate, just describe. Learning to describe is much more important than learning to evaluate. No? So that's uh, important. So uh, just uh, uh, some examples to, to uh, get it related to, to, the, to my ideas on research-based uh, pedagogy or teaching. And uh, in elementary school in Oxford in 2008, in, uh, in the second uh, classroom, secondary grade, uh, second grade classrooms, the question is 90 minus 25 is equal. You know, this is the question. Just very quick. You know, they use the, the kids use a computer to do this, this question. This is the first student. I, know, I, I, I should mention that uh, Wang Fang's Wang Fang, uh, teacher, Pro Professor Ma Yinpeng, uh, the major is mathematical teacher. Maybe you are very also familiar with mathematical teaching in China. All the first graders in China, uh, you know, uh, will tease uh, the, 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 the second grade graders in the U.S. Or, or, or Canada, you know, because all the students, you know, maybe uh, swiftly give the right answer. 90 minus 25 is very too simple, too easy question for Chinese uh, students, you know. But I don't think, you know, swiftly 
getting the right answer is the true meaning of mathematical education. You know, can, uh, you know let's find it. How, how do they do it? And uh, the second student, you know, come to the, uh, came to the front, you know. So, but she couldn't solve this problem and went back. And the, the third one come to the, came to the front, you know, correctly find the answer. I think she is from China. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. And the, the, this is uh, the third one. The, the fourth one, student, you know, gave nine uh, things. You know, one represent ten. So one, two, three, four, nine. This is 90. And how to minus 25? He, you know, delete one, delete two, and then divide this two parts and delete one. And then count it and find the answer. And teacher have them, you know, put it uh, right here. And then he finds the answer. But of course, this, this solution is very limited. If we put 90, minus 23, how to do it. But for this question, this problem, he solved. That's, that's his success, I think. That's important. I remember Ram Piaget, uh, uh, you know, Ram, uh, Ram Piaget was uh, the leader of national, uh, International uh, Bureau of Education for many, many years. And uh, in the late age of Ram Piaget, Ram Piaget said, the mathematics educators in the whole world are too, too lean on language and overlook the meaning of operations, including the mind operation. No? This is... Uh, so, I think, you know, this example, for example, the, the last children, the idea is similar uh, to uh, my idea on uh, 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 research-based pedagogy. The second uh, example is from last year. Last year in Orlando, in a, in a high school. I, I'm very like a biological class. I'm very like the atmosphere here. You know, this, this is a teacher, biological teacher. And each group, they will do research on the, on the pig, a, a small pig to do research on it. I like the, the atmosphere very, very much. You know. And uh, Bill, uh, Professor Bill, Bill Do and Bill Pine accompanied me to visit many schools in the US and Canada. And I try to find the good examples in the classrooms. And uh, uh, this is the, the second one. And the third, uh, third one, I want to uh, uh, give an example on the Chinese classroom. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, very familiar with uh, with a computer. So in a classroom, teacher raises a question, uh, negative three uh, times negative four is equal what? A student stand up and said, it is, the answer is nine. Many students laughed at him, teased him. Uh, but the teacher uh, keep very silent and try to understand why he gives the answer of nine. And these students go to the front and the right, here, you know. Teacher and the student, please hear. This is zero. What the meaning of, what the meaning of minus three? Here, you know, this zero, one, two, three. This is a minus three. What's the meaning of times minus four. That means go to the different direction for four times. This is first time. This is the second time. This is the third time. This is the fourth time, you know. Two, three, four. This is the meaning of minus three times minus four. He gives the answer, nine. You know, I think it's a very typical example for the 
classroom research. On, on one reason, on the one hand, no professional mathematicians deal with, solve this kind of problem, right? No, because it's not a, a professional uh, problem for the professional persons. But for school teachers and students, every day they think about this kind of problems. You know, in the past, we use the standards from the professional mathematicians, so they discard the values of this kind of problems. That's the problem. So now we should understand what they're thinking in what they're thinking in their so-called errors. You know that's important. So if we if we read Martin Heidegger, the German philosopher, the books, what is called thinking, we can find this kind of idea. You know, if there is truth in classroom teaching, the truth is in students' errors. You know, this is that the, the example. So this is, uh, I think, a good example for uh, my understanding of research-based pedagogy. So, my last point is my experimental framework. You know, in today's China, most of the elementary school classroom teaching is like this. Yeah. Right? Am I right? Wang Wang and other persons, you know, also, you know, everybody sits together. It is a Shanghai classroom, very, very typical. Different from uh, North America and the European, Europe. And uh, most of the high school students are like this. So, always do exercises and testing to prepare for the national examination for college entrance. Yes. So, my framework to do experimental work is I can generalize the one body, two wings. One body is educational democratization. And the one wing is life wing called life inquiry curriculum. I try to you know, uh, make the students' everyday life as a curriculum, and uh, help them find the themes to use their knowledge to explore uh, 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 it, and find the meanings of subject matters. You know, use the life in curriculum to destroy, break down the fence between the school and the society, the classroom and everyday life. You know, this is one way. The second way is the subject way. So, uh, I do subject inquiry pedagogy. Subject means subject matters. Subject inquiry uh, uh, pedagogy. That means to uh, transform the conclusions, uh, the principles, conceptions, structures, and uh, so on. Uh, uh, you know, in uh, exploring questions. You know, this is. This is called subject uh, inquiry pedagogy. This is my uh, experimental work. So, if I general, uh, I I have been doing this kind of experimental work for about ten years. I'm I, I'm still keep it. Okay. So my last word is aiming at moral creativity and educational democracy, and going toward the research based pedagogy. That's important both for students, teachers, and uh, educational researchers. Thank you.